Having reviewed NVIDIA's and AMD's latest product roadmaps in depth, I still believe AMD's dominance in the AI space is currently being disrupted by AMD. Further, my long-term AMD thesis does not actually depend on the successful disruption of NVIDIA since AMD has a highly differentiated, differentiated roadmap on its own. But the asymmetry in case of success is considerable, and that's why it's worth exploring. I've explained in the past that as we move towards smaller process nodes, the complexity of producing monolithic chips, NVIDIA's focus, is increasing exponentially. On the other hand, chiplet architecture, AMD's focus, is considerably less complex, assuming one has the necessary expertise. Less complexity means higher yields and therefore lower costs, which makes it likely that over a number of iterations, AMD's GPUs will eventually achieve a competitive price to performance ratio. So long as Nvidia remains set on the monolithic path, AMD is bound to catch up on the hardware side. Following the Nvidia GTC conference in March, the word on the street was that Nvidia had finally pivoted to chiplets, thus mitigating the risk of disruption. However, an in-depth review of Blackwell's architecture reveals that the chip essentially consists of two large, two large chips connected to each other. Previous NVIDIA architectures were fundamentally similar, but for the first time, Blackwell's two chips now act as one at the software and networking level. As such, Blackwell is technically made of two chiplets and thus represents a tentative first step towards the chiplet architecture for NVIDIA. In this sense, Blackwell is a provisional confirmation of my original observation that NVIDIA was going to have to pivot towards chiplets at some point. However, each of these two chiplets are as large as they can be, right at the limits of reticle size. NVIDIA is therefore already brushing the physical limit that makes producing monolithic chips exponentially harder as we move towards smaller process nodes. What this means, and this is where I think it gets very interesting, is that to add more computational power from here, NVIDIA faces either skyrocketing complexity within each of the two existing dies, or the prospect of adding subsequent monolithic chips together, add, adding them to the Blackwell architecture. Therefore, if NVIDIA does not fully pivot to, to AMD's turf, over the long term, one of the two things can happen. One, NVIDIA stays ahead by simply connecting more monolithic chips, each at the limit of the reticle size, as if they were chiplets, with AMD staying a marginal player. Two, the above approach doesn't scale so well relative to NVIDIA's quote-unquote pure chiplet architecture, with AMD gaining considerable, considerable market share at even the highest end. And by the way, a little note about the reticle limit. You can only make chips so big, which means that you have to cram everything into a certain area. To cram more computing, you have to build smaller circuits. And what's happening is that as the smaller as the circuits get smaller, the complexity of the design and the manufacturing process gets exponentially higher. So this is, this is the physical limit that I'm talking about that uh, NVIDIA is up against. A review of AMD's cDNA3 architecture, the one that powers the recently launched MI300 family, reveals that as anticipated, it is highly scalable and each component, chiplet, is far away from the reticle limit. AMD therefore does not have to push the limit of physics to continue making higher performing GPUs from here. Rather, AMD just needs to carry on adding more chiplets, a skill that it's been honing for a decade now. From a low level perspective, connecting monolithic chips as if they were chiplets is bound to deliver much lower yields than AMD's approach. In the former case, if one component goes wrong, you have to throw away a highly costly marvel of modern engineering. In the latter approach, throwing away a tiny chiplet won't cost as much. If NVIDIA does end up with meaningfully lower yields than AMD, this actually does not automatically mean, excuse me, that it won't produce the highest performing products. Yield is a metric that concerns the manufacturing process and does not actually say anything about the performance of a chip in question. What is clear to me, however, is that AMD has a structural advantage at present to bring AI compute engines to the market with a differentiated price to performance ratio. And over time, this should abstracting away the complexities um, related to the software and the networking components, which I'm going to address uh, towards the end of this video, 
that AMD should be gaining market share over time. The graph that you can see on the screen now is an illustration of how AMD can quickly repurpose its MI300 platform to fill gaps in the market. Personalization, one of the core tailwinds behind AMD's aforementioned roadmap, adds a component to the hardware side of the disruption thesis. By pursuing a quote-unquote pure chiplet architecture, AMD can combine computer engines at will. The MI300A is an example of this. It's simply the MI300X minus a few GPU tiles with some additional CPU tiles in their place. It allows AMD to unlock new applications for the MI300 platform at a marginal cost, opening up less contested distribution channels for its core AI technology. In this particular case, the MI300A is an APU, an accelerated processing unit, which is designed to handle both general processing and graphics processing. This makes APUs ideal for systems in which space and power consumption are a concern, including laptops, entry-level desktops, and small form-factor devices. In the Q4 2023 earnings call, AMD CEO Lisa Su made particular emphasis on AI PCs. The marginal difference between the MI300A and the MI300X sheds some light on how AMD is planning to go about these novel PCs. NVIDIA management also emphasized AI PCs during the Q4 call, but the same logic regarding yields and personalization applies to this domain. AMD has the structural advantage to repurpose its core AI technology across the spectrum of computing devices. The biggest component of uncertainty in the thesis, in the idea of potentially AMD disrupting NVIDIA, comes from the fact that even though AMD has a relatively clear path ahead on the hardware side, NVIDIA software and networking operations continue to get stronger. And what happens is that these compute engines need a specific set of software and networking components to be useful at all in practice. Even though AMD may deliver compute engines with a better price to performance ratio at some point, without a vertically integrated infrastructure like NVIDIA's, the actual cost of ownership may be much higher. NVIDIA has a remarkable software advantage with CUDA, the framework that seamlessly allows developers to interact with NVIDIA GPUs. However, AMD has been quietly funding open source operations to get its software up to scratch and is now officially open sourcing parts of its ROCM software, which is basically its CUDA equivalent. AMD's decision to open source ROCM came from the controversy generated on X after tiny grads George Hotz complained about the unstable driver, the software, uh, supporting AMD's hardware. This includes the release of a feature called quote-unquote Fussy HSA that allows AMD developers to get real-time feedback from users slash open source developers. Although most of this activity is barely visible to outside observers, over the long term, the open source approach combined with AMD's budding software capabilities via the Pensando acquisition primarily has a real chance of competing with CUDA if the hardware progresses as, as, progresses as I expect. Fundamentally speaking, the software dilemma is therefore now AMD and the open source community versus NVIDIA. This considerably increases the odds of AMD's structural differentiation on the hardware side bearing fruit down the line, since the world naturally wants to avoid being logged into a single vendor. In the Q4 2023 earnings call, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang mentioned how NVIDIA has been developing software for specific verticals for a decade now finance, healthcare, biology, and more. And this is actually a moat, which is very similar to the one that Palantir has been building over the past two decades, with everyone now trying to get into the business, only to realize that it's actually very, very difficult to deploy dig digital twins for companies that operate in such sensitive and critical um, verticals. This complicates things further for AMD. It takes a long time to get all the little details right to serve customers in these such critical verticals. In turn, NVIDIA's networking business remains head and shoulders above AMD's. Its networking revenue run, run rate exceeded 13 billion in Q4 2023, and this is up from 10 billion last quarter, which makes for spectacular growth quarter over quarter. As I've explained in the past, when it comes to AI, 
moving data is around is as important as the actual compute. A compute engine without the adequate infrastructure to move data around is relatively useless in practice. A booming networking business therefore gives NVIDIA a considerable advantage, much like its software endeavors. About the financials, my key takeaway is that the balance sheet is very, very strong with the revenue growing spectacularly and the cash flow profile gaining exponentially stronger every quarter. And what's really interesting is that the auto and pro visualization segments are set to meaningfully contribute to NVIDIA's top and bottom line over the coming decade. And I will explain why towards the end of the financial section. About the income statement, NVIDIA's revenue and operat operating margins continue pushing through all-time highs. OPEX as a percentage of revenue has also declined meaningfully since late 2021, with the company getting much leaner, which I would obviously welcome as a shareholder. Gross margins also continue pushing through all-time highs, albeit driven this quarter by quote-unquote favorable component costs. Management expects this tailwind to continue in Q1 2024 before subsiding. In turn, as I mentioned, the pro visualization and auto segments are highly strategic. Although data center is driving much of the stellar financial performance at present, auto and pro visualization are positioned to grow meaningfully as digital twins become the norm and the software defined car comes into play. As many of you know, this is uh, these are two trends that I'm very big on. Incidentally, NVIDIA's pro visualization segment focuses on providing high-performance graphics hardware and software used primarily for professional design, visual effects, and real-time simulation tasks in industries like architecture, engineering, and entertainment. In turn, the auto segment of NVIDIA targets the automotive industry, offering solutions that power autonomous driving systems, such as the one that Mercedes-Benz just released an update on, which is all over the news, in-car infotainment, and AI-based functionalities to enhance vehicle capabilities and user experience. The visualization of digital twins makes them more accessible and thus effective across an organization. And by the way, if you are new to my work, the thing with digital twins is that they enable an organization to deploy AI in a relatively seamless manner, so to drastically increase productivity. The company, in my opinion, that best does this in Western civilization is Palantir, and that's why I've been a shareholder for a while. I am perhaps an early investor in terms of the stock market. And this is why I keep talking about digital twins. So in, in turn, while the world quarrels over whether electric vehicles are the future or not, what is also relatively certain is that they will be smartphones on wheels. They will be connected. They will be software defined. So NVIDIA is very well positioned to capitalize on these two trends. Further, in the Q4 2023 earnings call, Jensen talked about NVIDIA Enterprise, which will allegedly manage clients' entire computers, computing stack for $4,500 per GPU. This strengthens the moat by fully abstracting away complexity for clients and thus having them lean more on, on NVIDIA's vertically integrated infrastructure. It will only get harder to lure customers away from NVIDIA once they start piling into NVIDIA Enterprise. As volume increases, NVIDIA should be able to lower the cost to serve over time. Emulating NVIDIA's vertical integration will become even harder uh, with time, straight from the playbooks of Amazon and Tesla, which I have also done uh, a fair amount of work on. About the cash flow statements, a picture is worth a thousand words. So long as NVIDIA continues to produce the world's leading GPUs, together with its undisputed software and networking ecosystems, the cash flow will likely continue increasing. And about the balance sheet, at the end of Q4 2023, NVIDIA had $25.9 billion in cash and equivalents and just $8.45 billion in long-term debt and, quite interestingly, $1.25 billion in short-term debt. So the balance sheet remains very, very strong and as long as they continue producing the world's leading AI compute engines, I believe that the, um, this, the wall chest will just keep getting stronger. To conclude, analyzing the potential disruption of NVIDIA's dominance yields insights that would otherwise be harder to visualize for me. It sharpens my understanding of both NVIDIA's and AMD's product roadmaps, and as such, I consider it a productive activity on its own. Having said that, if my understanding of the monolithic versus chiplet dilemma is correct, I believe that AMD is positioned to cause much more trouble <clears throat> than it's given credit for. However, this very much depends on whether AMD's open source software bears fruit, 
which I will be tracking very closely. Meanwhile, as the world's demand for computing power continues to grow exponentially, I believe that both companies are set to do very well over the long term. It is very likely that NVIDIA finds a way to continue scaling its monolithic efforts from here and that AMD finds a recipe that works too. I believe this space won't actually evolve into a winner-takes-all scenario because the market wants redundancy. Relying on a sole provider for compute engines is a severe existential risk for any market player. So until next time, and thank you very much for joining me. If you did enjoy this update, can I please ask you one favor? And that would be to share this with one friend. These updates are for free, and so the only way this grows is with your help. So thank you very much in advance, and take care.